And now my carving my Kiki my Kitene Wanaka on uh, contact recreation, the contact recreation monitoring program. Welcome to you all. Uh, just before we start, just to point out emergency procedures if we need to evacuate. I mean, obviously, I think we're all pretty familiar with the drop, cover, and hold. But uh, if you need to, if we have to evacuate, and there's an exit here or at the back and down the stairs, and we'll meet out on the car park uh, as the assembly area. And I can't remember this room. There, there are some toilets. Just, oh, just, yeah, just behind with the tea and coffee out. Um, I'm Tim Navy, Surface Water Science Manager here at ECAN, and um, it's a pleasure to introduce this um, science seminar this afternoon. It's uh, this, one of the things we've been trying to do in the science seminars is promoting science and promoting some of the monitoring programs that we're involved in in the um, science group. And this is uh, a really important monitoring program that we're going to talk about today, the, what we call the Contact Recreation Program. And um, in fact, it's important for several reasons, one of which is that it's in the CWMS targets. You, there is a target specifically based on the monitoring that's done in this program. It's also really important for our community. It's one of our most watched sites on our website and also on Facebook. And in fact, I got a request this morning that came via Facebook about this monitoring program. It is really popular. People are obviously really interested in where they can swim and what the water quality is like. It's also really important because it's one of our longest, in fact, I think it is, the longest running monitoring program that we've got in the council. And it's particularly apt because if you look over this way here right now, you'll see somebody just sitting down who was involved very early on in the, this program. Um, that's Ken, Ken Taylor. And I know that it's over 31 years old, this program, because Ken told me <laughs> yesterday that on Monday he celebrates 31 years of working for the North Canterbury Catchment Board and, in, and the Regional Council. So it's over 30 years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, and in fact, if I'd been really well organised, I could have shown you a picture of Ken taking samples aged considerably younger than he is now, <laughs> and you may have struggled to recognise him, but I forgot to get it organised. I do have it though, and I can produce it if anybody wants to have a look at that. So it's a long running programme, and length of time is really important for monitoring, because it's through that you can start drawing trends and, and things like that. So um, it's important, it is this very important monitoring programme, and it's great to be able to introduce uh, Dr Leslie Bolton Ritchie and Kimberly Robinson from the Surface Water Science team who are involved in running the program and um, have been for a while involved in running the program. And they're gonna talk us through what's done and uh, how the results are shared. So Leslie's gonna start. been involved in this program since 2003, so when I first arrived at Environment Canterbury, it was like walking the door and Ken, Ken sort of says, right, we've got to get organised for this summer, so I was thrown in pretty quickly into this program. So uh, what we're presenting today about our water quality monitoring program is some background information about what we're going to present and some of the terminology that we use. We're going to look at a bit about the science, about what is affecting the water quality. We are going to describe the monitoring program and then how we assess the data. So there are two parts that we're going to cover. I'm going to cover one part. So these bottom three points I'm going to cover with one aspect and then Kimberly will cover them with her particular aspect and then we will look at uh, other aspects of the program including how we collaborate, how we inform the public and Tim's already mentioned this, how we use the data in other ways. 
So there are two aspects that we're covering and I'm going to be looking at the, the microbiology, which is the pathogens, the bacteria, viruses, etc. Uh, which all relate to fecal contamination of the water and Kimberly is going to do the part on the toxic cyanobacteria, which is uh, a freshwater issue. Uh, the microbiology that I'm doing covers freshwater and marine. So some of the terminology that we use, we talk about contact recreation. Because I'm so familiar with the program, I'm probably going to talk about contact rec, recreational water quality, micro bugs. So, you know, really it's all about um, some of the terminology, as I mentioned, and one of them is contact rec. And uh, nowadays, um, particularly now with national guidelines, we're, we're looking at these two aspects of contact recreation, and one is primary contact recreation, which uh, basically the programs we're running are reporting about against guidelines and considering primary contact recreation, but there are many aspects of secondary which is um, being developed nationally for guidelines for that as well. So I hope you've got a fair idea just by looking at that slide of the different um, things that we have considered primary and those we consider secondary. Leslie, as a water kayaker of 31 years experience, it's absolutely a primary contact Conversion <laughs> <laughs> of water is not just possible but inevitable. That's a suggestion. So maybe a little kayak that you could bump them up to the up to the top right. Uh, if I you know, I'm just basing this on what is written by the the powers that be the scientists in terms of definitions and they define how many minutes immersion there's likely to be and how much water you're likely to ingest. So I've really summarised that down there. So, you know, in terms of that sort of scientific definitions, you know, there could be a bit of debate against about where you fit in. But I agree, you know, some people are very skilled and they wouldn't spend a lot of time in the kayak and others would spend a lot of time in the water. <laughs> uh, another aspect is community, and Tim has mentioned that the public are very interested in this data and our results. And the whole idea of the program is to provide people with information so they can make informed decisions. So uh, it's not like, you know, it's bad here, you can't swim, you'll get stuck in jail if you swim here. It's like, it's bad here, we advise you not to swim, but it's your choice. Now the only time when it ever was um, almost illegal, illegal to swim in certain areas was straight after the first round of September earthquakes when they actually put it in place and they had the police monitoring rivers and beaches that you shouldn't go to those sites. The rest of the time it can only be an advisory. And so if you see uh, warnings out against <coughs> Uh, swimming at a beach or in a river and there are uh, people there, it's their choice, you know, because they've been warned. Okay, so I'm talking about the microorganism side of it, the faecal contamination, and microorganisms that are present in water, a bacteria, and some examples of bacteria. Kimberly, which ones are these? <laughs> which one is the pointer? that we've got some bacteria here. This is Entrococci. This one here is Campylobacter, which is a bacteria. This one here is a protozoa. This is Giardia. This is an example of a virus down the bottom corner here. And this one here is E. coli. 
Yeah, they look pretty amazing in these pictures. Um, it's a great thing about these biological stains and electron microscopes, the sort of views that you get. So those are the sorts of things that are in the water and you can get a lot of diseases like um, salmonella, cryptosporidium, hepatitis, adenovirus, enterovirus. So there's a lot of diseases that humans can get if you have some of these things in the water. So when we take a water sample, we have these things called fecal indicator bacteria that we actually measure. They are present in the water. They don't actually cause um, a problem to human health, but they're an indication of whether there are these pathogens, disease-causing viruses, bacteria, and other organisms in the water, because the more of these fecal indicator bacteria you have, the more chance that you're going to have these pathogens, these things are going to cause your health problems. So the ones that we use, we have these fecal indicator bacteria, we use concentrations of entrococci, and that's used for seawater. We have E. coli, which is used in fresh water, and in estuarine water where you've got to mix in marine and fresh, then we use both of them. <laughs> now, why do we bother? You know, we've got all these disease-causing organisms in the water, and these are the things that can happen. You can get um, terrible diarrhoea and stomach bugs. You can get ear infections. You can get infected sores and respiratory illness. So there's a lot of human health issues that can be associated uh, with the water that you undertake recreation in. And uh, even in puddles, and kids splashing in puddles, you know, there, there are all of these, there can be pathogens as well, depending on the source. Now, the source of the microorganisms and these disease-causing organisms, the pathogens that we are concerned about, there are multiple sources, but it is the warm-blooded animals, and including humans as well. So here you can see quite a range of the different sources of the microorganisms that we get in our water, and obviously different water, different sources, depending on what's happening in the catchment. <coughs> Now, quite recently, probably in the last 10 years, techniques have developed where if you've got microorganisms in the water, they can use a range of different techniques to determine or get an indication of the potential source of that fecal contamination. And there are three different ways that they do it. And the first is this thing called whitening agents, which are in washing powders. So people are using washing powders and that goes obviously down your drain or go into a septic tank or into a sewage system. Those whitening agents, they can test for them in the environment and that gives an indication that we have a human source of fecal contamination. Another, another source is um, looking at sterols, which are like a, a lipids, which are fatty substances that occur in the faecal material. And they are found in various types and various ratios, depending on whether it's humans or birds. So it's the whole signature and ratios of these different chemicals that give an indication of the source. And the last one is a called PCR markers, uh, where they take the DNA and split up and um, grow different portions and quantify them. And again, they have different markers for different species, that they have different bacteria. It is very complicated, so when they're doing this sort of work, they do a whole lot of tests for those different markers. So. Uh, this information on the faecal source markers, this was actually from a website, which is an ESR website, which has um, got a lot of very good information, and they do the testing for us when we're getting this work done. Now, this type of work 
is very costly. So for example, um, these results here, which come from a site on the Avon River, and they're quite recent results, uh, they didn't do the fecal whitening agent as part of this analysis, but if they'd done that as part of this analysis to get this data from six different occasions, it would have cost $10,000. So for this particular one without it, it was about 7500 So. It's a process that doesn't get used very often, but it gives a very, it's very helpful when you're doing investigations uh, to determine your potential sources of the faecal bacteria at a site. So I'm just going to go through this table. And first of all, uh, if they are doing faecal source tracking, the first thing you need is quite a few indicator bacteria because if you don't have enough indicator bacteria to start off, it's no point doing the rest of the analysis because you won't have enough quantity of the other particular indicators. So this site is on the Avon River, and the Avon River is usually got pretty high numbers of indicator bacteria. So it's a good start. And you can see there's quite a difference here between dry and when there's rainfall, the indicator bacteria. You can also see uh, when it was raining, there was a lot more campylobacteria present in the sample. Okay, and then getting on to the PCR markers, you can see now there's quite a bit of different information combined, which gives an overall picture of what the main sources are of that faecal contamination. So for example, if you look at the base, the base flow results, you can see here that there's a small indication here of a human marker, but it was only one of the markers, and that particular marker can be found in uh, dogs, cats, rabbits, and possums, and there was no other evidence from the sterols to say that there was a human influence. So in terms of base flows, even though that it, it does suggest by looking at this table that maybe there was a human influence, there actually wasn't, and it's dominated by wild fowl. But looking at the rainfall, you can see that there is a very strong suggestion here of human source, but also uh, wildfowl and dogs. So basically it's saying at the site uh, when it's raining you're getting a lot of wash off probably from the land, so you're getting all, all your dog sources, you're getting the waterfowl sources and the human source. In this case there are no surge overflow discharges but we know in Christchurch there are a lot of problems with the infrastructure and so there's obviously some leaking between pipes going into the area. So it's all of those together, as I said, I'll reiterate that they tell an overall picture and you have to use all three different things to get a picture. Okay, so going on with our monitoring program, and this is where the rubber hits the road and what we do, we have a lot of sites <coughs> that are sampled. And we've started our sampling for this, this summer. It started about two or three weeks ago. And now uh, our sampler, we have three students. We've got two in the audience. We've got Emily, who's returned for her third summer, and Melissa, who's new to this position. And they're going out weekly to sites on the set runs to collect the samples um, when they're out there. And the photo at the bottom is Melissa at Purao, which was taken last week. OK, so this is the range of our sites. We have sites in Kaikoura, uh, right down to Waitaki, Waitaki Lakes. So the person in the field, they collect a water sample, but they also make observations. We're recording things like rainfall, people, birds, wind, um, colour of the water, because if we get high results, we need to look at for possible explanations of why they occur. 
but as well at freshwater sites, there are bankside observations for this cyanobacteria that Kimberly's going to talk about. And at coastal sites, we also make observations of um, scum on the water. This one here was taken by Emily at Monks Bay last week. Um, we look for things at certain times of the year, we're getting our blue bottles, or we're looking for things like um, sea lettuce, etc., which indicates eutrophication. So uh, we're getting a lot of good observations of what's happening on our beaches. And for example, we do have algal blooms, the coastal algal blooms with Pegasus Bay. In our beaches, we do get this thing called Biosurf Diatom. So if you go to the beaches and see it looking like this, um, and it's actually a natural event, and um, this particular bloom is not toxic. So the water sample is collected, it's at, taken to the laboratory and analysed. It goes to Hill Laboratories, which is in Christchurch. Uh, for people that are collecting samples in Timaru, it gets couriered up and so it doesn't get to the lab until the next morning. So the, the sample has to be within the lab within 24 hours of being collected. And then the sample processing takes 24 hours. And so it's not an in instantaneous value that we get. It's some, somewhat out of date by the time we get the result for a site because the data comes through to us and then it actually has to be manually uploaded into our database before it goes onto the website. So it's pretty critical that um, all of these processes work well and quickly so that the information can get out there. But uh, even though we take our water quality samples, for example, we might sample at 10 o'clock and we get a certain value, 10.30, the water quality at that site might be completely different. You know, there might have been birds and there might have been people or dogs. So we really only, the, the data that we collect is really only a good guide to the general state of that site. So what do we do with the data once we have it? <coughs> Well, the whole thing about um, doing this program is about the risk to human health. And it doesn't matter what, there's always a risk. So we use New Zealand guidelines to interpret our data. But even those guidelines are based on risk. So you never, there's never any chance that there's going to be zero risk. And um, these are considered acceptable risks by, by the experts. Now, I don't know why there's a difference between marine and fresh water. I reckon maybe marine people swallow more water because of the waves, or maybe it's they're just a more robust lot, or who knows. But uh, it's just to say that it doesn't matter what you do, there's going to be a risk if you know, be going out into the water. So we analyse our, our values that we get against our New Zealand guideline values. And we have what these things call trigger values. So, you know, you don't have to learn this table, but um, Kimberly and I know it pretty well, and in fact, off by heart. And so, well, Emily and Melissa and those involved in the program. But if we have acceptable values, we don't do anything, we just, you know, record it, it goes onto the website. As soon as we start getting an alert value, the lab will tell the samplers and they, they go out and resample the site. And that value has to come back um, below a certain value that we don't keep resampling. And then when we get these high values, um, you need two of them in a row, you need that resample value to be high and then uh, action really cranks up. Now, it's very rare, I think in the time I've been here, there might have been one occasion when we actually got to that action level. So that's one in quite a few years. So it doesn't usually happen because, for example, we might get a high value because of rainfall. The next day the rainfall stopped. Or there might be a high value because it was due to birds. The next day they're not there. We've had a couple of times we've had for high values last year at beaches where uh, we attribute it to humans using the beaches because they were really hot days and we got high values and there was 
no other possible explanation for the results. <clears throat> so using um, the data and a various measures, I'll explain how we do it, but we actually grade our sites. And so uh, very good sites, there's not much risk to your health if you're using them, but very poor, you know, we, as those sites we don't recommend you swim at. And this is an example at the end of 2014-15 summer. This is um, the division of our sites in those various grades. So you can see, you know, we do have quite a range. Definitely our coastal sites uh, seem to be faring better than our freshwater sites. And the freshwater sites here are the lake and the rivers. So I think it is different for the lakes if they're separated out compared to the rivers in terms of percentages. Those are percentages. Uh, calculating the grade is uh, just punch in a few numbers and come up with the grid. We use this grid here. Again, it's uh, we need five years of microbiology data to start with, so you just don't use one data point. By using five years of data, you can get a general indication of what that site is like. You're not just basing it on a couple of data points saying it's really bad or really good. You need quite a bit of information, so you uh, cover all different aspects about the site. And then we go to a site and we would assess where any faecal contamination will potentially come from. So for example, well I'm going to give an example in a minute, but that, I think that's a really important assessment as well because some sites have a lot of potential sources of faecal contamination and some don't. So you combine those together to get the grade. And so we do recommend, because data can be so variable on a, in a day and between days, that people use the grade as a general indication of the health of the site or the suitability of the site for recreation. Okay, so a couple of examples of um, sites. We've got freshwater site here. We've got Kaiapoi River. Uh, we've got a list here. There's four potential sources of faecal contamination we've identified. And what you do is find the most high-risk one, and that would, will give you this sanitary inspection category. And for this site, it's high. And then... We've used the data, so each year we take the latest data and drop off you know, the sixth year of data, so we're continually um, reassessing the grade for a site. So at the end of last year, and the grade that applies this year, it's very poor at this site. And so when it's very poor, there's warning signage at a site. And you can see the site's been very poor for a considerable period of time. Okay, another marine site, Corsia Bay, different sources. Uh, again, you can see the different things, but this site, the grade has changed over time. Uh, and Corsia Bay is quite an interesting one because it's a site where the city council, because there seemed to be a problem in Corsia Bay, there's a stream that gets a lot of stormwater, the City Council went round house by house checking all of the uh, infrastructure joins of houses to stormwater and wastewater system and people did some fix-ups in the area and that seemed to improve uh, what was happening in the catchment and coming into that bay. mentioned there's two aspects to the contact rec program and this aspect is the potentially toxic cyanobacteria or blue-green algae as some of you might notice. Um, cyanobacteria are in the simplest form bacteria that look and behave like algae um, and they obtain their energy from photosynthesis. In aquatic environments there are um, planktonic algae which are kind of like suspended algae um, in slow moving water such as lakes, and also benthic algae which is attached to the substrate, substrate such as in riverbeds. Uh, some of these species have the ability to produce toxins and can be considered potentially toxic or harmful to humans and animals. 
So a number of these cyanobacteria species have the ability to produce cyanotoxins, and these can have some pretty nasty side effects for um, both humans and animals who come into contact with them. Uh, people using water bodies for recreational purposes are most likely to experience maximum exposure when a bloom develops near um, entry points to waterways um, from the more use, uh, more um, the more risk of coming in contact with the water. Um, this includes activities such as swimming, um, also drinking water, and consumption of mahinga kai. Uh, cyanotoxins bioaccumulate in species that live in the water, such as fish and eels, um, and therefore the Christ, uh, Canterbury District Health Board recommend removing any internal organs if you're going to be eating these species. And there have also been reports um, from anglers fishing in the rivers that some of the fish they catch uh, taste kind of tainted in rivers that have cyanobacteria blooms. So coming into contact with or ingesting um, cyanotoxins can produce both short and long term health risk symptoms. The cyanotoxins have a broad range of toxicity mechanisms ranging from dermatoxicity which affects the skin to hepatoxicity which affects the liver and to neurotoxicity which affects uh, nerves and nerve tissues. Uh, symptoms therefore may include skin rashes, nausea, diarrhea, or tingling sensations around the mouth or your fingertips. Um, and some cyanotoxins have been shown to have longer term effects by promoting um, liver tumour growth when ingested over low doses over extended periods. Um, cyanotoxins have also been known to be the cause of multiple dog deaths throughout the region. We generally hear from the public more about the dog deaths. Um, it's fairly well publicised rather than hearing about people who have had side effects from swimming in the rivers, but um, it's likely that the people don't realise that the skin rash that they have or feeling unwell is coming from the cyanobacteria. And also it's more likely that the dogs are more inclined to eat the cyanobacteria itself, whereas humans are most likely um, affected by direct contact. Uh, so Environment Canary monitor for the cyanobacteria species um, which have the ability to produce toxins um, and are therefore considered a public health risk. We monitor in lakes where potentially toxic cyanobacteria are known to occur. Um, additionally, if there's a visible scum observed in the lake, we often respond by initiating monitoring um, if we consider that there will be a public health risk. We also monitor rivers for cyanobacteria, um, more specifically the Formidium species you may have heard about. Uh, this is a black or brown mat and it has a musty earthy smell and a thick velvety appearance. Um, as you can tell from these pictures, these groups of cyanobacteria are really different. Um, so we consider them as two separate groups and have different monitoring response protocols for that. <coughs> So what triggers these cyanobacteria blooms? Um, it's been really well researched in lakes, however there's quite limited knowledge in river cyanobacteria. Um, what we do know is that the onset of cyanobacteria blooms generally occur when the temperatures are increasing, there's more light availability, and this for, therefore triggers germination and activation of cyanobacteria. Also nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, are essential for algal growth. And this is no different for cyanobacteria, um, although their nutrient requirements differ among species. Uh, current research is also looking at whether iron concentrations may be a factor of cyanobacteria blooms. Um, iron, like nitrogen and phosphorus, is found to be influencing cyanobacteria growth in lakes, and there's potential um, further research to look at iron in rivers. So as I said, these um, some bacteria are quite different, so they've also got different triggers. Um, Plantain-like cyanobacteria such as Anabina and Nodularia have the ability to fix nitrogen, and therefore they can be more reliant on um, elevated phosphorus concentrations in lakes. Um, and then also iron, like nitrogen and phosphorus, as I said before, has been found to influence cyanobacteria growth in lakes. Um, 
research into the cause of benthic cyanobacteria blooms is fairly recent um, and it's quite ongoing at this stage. Uh, the benthic cyanobacteria firmidium is not nitrogen fixing like those late species I just mentioned. And so recent studies have found that these species may be correlated to elevated nitrogen and lower phosphorus concentrations. Um, especially, they're especially found in areas of rivers where upwelling groundwater rich in nitrates is occurring. However, it's also been suggested that benthic sun bacteria may be sourcing their phosphorus um, elsewhere, not from within the water column. Um, so this may be from trapping sediment under their thick mats, and therefore the phosphorus wouldn't have been detected in the water sample, although this research is still ongoing. Uh, and current research is also looking at whether the iron um, that seems to be playing a role in lakes is also playing a role in rivers. Um, and so there's more potential for that research. And then also in rivers, the cyanobacteria blooms are influenced by bed, bed movement and flow regimes. Uh, when the river flows are low and the bed is stable, um, mats are able to proliferate and they require flushing flows to tear the mats off the substrate. So the research at the moment is also looking at substrate size and whether or not um, the mats are growing on larger cobbles that, which are less susceptible to bed movement and also looking at different flow velocities. So how do we monitor the cyanobacteria? Um, as you can tell, they're quite different between the two rivers and lakes. Um, so we have different monitoring methods, of course, and also different response protocols. Um, in the past, the majority of potentially toxic cyanobacteria blooms have occurred in lowland lakes. Um, these lakes, such as Te Waihora, Wairewa, and Lake Rotorua, are um, monitored routinely for um, state of the environment water quality. And this includes monitoring for nutrients, water clarity, the E. coli that Leslie mentioned earlier, and um, chlorophyll A to measure the um, algal concentrations. And as part of this routine monitoring, we also take a sample for the cyanobacteria taxa, and this identifies and measures the volume of cyanobacteria and other algal species. So major potentially toxic <coughs> cyanobacteria species in Canterbury Lakes include microcystis, anabena, nodularia, and uh, pico cyanobacteria. So in previous years, anabena and nodularia have been the more dominant, um, potentially toxic species in Te Waihora. Um, however, most recently, it's shifted to a pico cyanobacteria bloom. So the anabena and the nodularia species produce really bright, visible um, scums in the lake, really green, super coloring. Whereas the pico cyanobacteria, you don't notice the effects as much. It's much clearer water from what we've noticed. Um, and the pico cyanobacteria are quite different from the anabena and nodularia blooms because the um, species are too small to identify and therefore we don't know um, the toxicity of them or their potential toxicity. Um, and so we just have to treat them as a potentially toxic species like the rest. So benthic cyanobacteria is monitored during the summer months when the blooms generally occur and recreational use in the rivers is greatest. Uh, Environment Canterbury employee um, students, as Lisa mentioned, um, and so while they're out taking their weekly uh, E. coli sample, they'll make a bankside observation at each river as well, and let us know what the bankside estimate cover of the cyanobacteria is. So this is called the surveillance mode of monitoring. Uh, looking at this picture, I'd say there's about 30% cover in this river, so we would have to action that into a warning response. So where do we monitor? Um, as I mentioned, while out monitoring for E. coli, we take bankside observations in the rivers, uh, and also we take um, monitoring from lakes throughout routine monitoring throughout the year. So the orange dots on this map represent um, the lakes that we have had planktonic cyanobacteria blooms in most commonly. Um, the red dots show rivers where there have been benthic cyanobacteria blooms, and the green dots show where we monitor rivers, but there have been no blooms um, <coughs> recently to date. And this is due to a low percent cover. 
seem to have lost some of my words. That's fine. <laughs> Um, so in 2009, there were some interim guidelines developed to protect users from the risks associ associated with the ingestion and contact of cyanotoxins. Uh, these guidelines were intended to help agencies develop monitoring protocols for local conditions and also circumstances. Uh, these protocols allow us to work collaboratively with community and public health, local authorities such as district and city councils. Um, the protocols follow an alert framework similar to the trigger values for microbiolog micro microbiological monitoring that Leslie mentioned earlier. And this follows the three tiers of alert levels of surveillance, alert and action. And it's designed to manage risks to recreational users. Um, however, given cyanobacteria is so different between lakes and rivers, there are different criteria for these alerts. So for lakes, when the volume of potentially toxic cyanobacteria exceeds the national thresholds, we respond by increasing our monitoring to fortnightly for alert values and weekly when the action value, which is a higher value, is triggered. Um, the response level is determined by the volume of potentially toxic cyanobacteria taxa and when the action level is triggered, we notify community and public health and they issue, publicly issue a warning due to the associated health risks and the local council will erect signage in place at the lake. In order to downgrade the warning, you need two consecutive samples below the alert or action thresholds. Uh, in rivers, when the 20% stream bed cover is exceeded, we move from surveillance level to alert or action level. So when this happens, we require more intensive monitoring of cyanobacteria where we conduct transect surveys, similar to what Graham's doing down here in the corner. Um, and we use a stream bed viewer to get a better idea of what the cyanobacteria cover is. Uh, this is in addition to the bank site observations that are made weekly by the students. Uh, the alert level is when the percent cover is between 20 to 50 percent cover and the mats are firmly attached to the substrate. At this stage we'll just notify community and public health and the local authority. Um, and then at the recreational site where cyanobacteria issues have been in the past, there will already be an information sign in place um, so that everyone knows what to look out for and provide a bit more information. And then at this stage we won't require any further response until the action level is triggered. Um, when the percent cover exceeds 50% or remains below 50% and the match start to detach from the rocks and become exposed and accumulate in the river, um, we move into action level. Uh, the community and public health are notified and they publicly issue a warning and local, um, local councils will arrange for warning signage to be put up at the river. In order to downgrade these warnings, we require also two consecutive samples below the alert or action thresholds. So when it comes to monitoring responsibility, there are three different agencies involved, depending on the area of concern. We've got the Canterbury District Health Board or Community and Public Health, as we call them. Um, they kind of oversee the program and arrange any protocols, media releases, and meetings between all three agencies. Um, the matter of public health is the responsibility of community and public health. Therefore, it's their role to ensure that the public is suitably um, notified through media releases and ensuring the correct signage is in place. Uh, our role at Environment Canterbury is to do the environmental monitoring of which that public health risk is based on. We therefore are responsible for the weekly monitoring and reporting, as well as including it in, in, informing the agencies when the guideline <coughs> trigger values are exceeded, and we also carry out any annual reporting. Uh, we undertake any investigations <coughs> in the cause of such exceedances to find out what's causing any exceedances, and we also carry out, as Leslie mentioned, fecal source tracking or any funding for cyanobacteria research. Uh, 
It is the responsibility of the local authority to ensure that signage is in place under the direction of community and public health. So media releases are issued by community and public health. Um, these usually describe what to look out for and they include a comment from a medical health officer and they also provide a list of symptoms. And sorry, I should have explained that this stage of the presentation applies to both um, micro and cyanobacteria when we're dealing with collaborative um, between us community and public health and local authorities. Um, signage has been developed by all three agencies together um, to best suit the health risk at each site. Um, permanent signage will be in place at sites with reoccurring health risks, uh, while temporary signage will be, in put in, will be put in place at sites that are unsuitable for recreation that may be temporarily compromised. So the public health risk is based on the suitability for recreation and cyanobacteria cover, and they're both risk-based measures. Therefore, together with community and public health and the local authorities, we work to manage the risk by communication in the form of media releases, signage, and most recently we have started also notifying Runanga. We also aim to manage the risk by managing the cause. For fecal contamination, we aim to manage the risk by identifying the source of con contamination and we work with communities in ways to reduce such a source, such as um, by putting in fencing and riparian planting around waterways. For cyanobacteria blooms, we know that nutrient enrichment and sustained low flows play a role and we need to focus on these when we're feeding them into waterways management. So with this all in mind, monitoring and reporting from the Recreational Water Quality Program feeds into many other areas of ECAN. Uh, both the suitability for recreation grade uh, and cyanobacteria cover are freshwater outcomes in the Land and Water Regional Plan. Uh, recreation is also considered an important value throughout Canterbury and the management of waterways is, an important, is important to ensure our freshwater environment can be used for recreational purposes. Uh, the reporting of recreational water quality, as Tim mentioned earlier, may be used for zone targets um, where zone committees may drive investigations into the cause of fecal contamination or where cyanobacteria blooms are. And together we develop and develop mitigation measures such as stock exclusion and riparian planting. Uh, so for example, currently we're carrying out an investigation in the Waihe River. This is above the poorly graded Waihe Gorge site. Uh, in the past, stock access has been observed at this site and is considered a potential contamination source. So we're now working within this catchment with the community to find priority areas for fencing based on fecal contamination results of an investigation this summer. Uh, also, the suitability for recreation grades and cyanobacteria cover are used in the annual plan to determine the number of sites suitable for recreation and whether or not these meet the annual plan targets mentioned earlier for recreation. Uh, the information collected from our recreational water quality program may be used by our scientists in resource management submissions or as evidence in hearings. And then moving forward into sub-regional planning, both fecal contamination and cyanobacteria are important aspects to take into consideration. Uh, the more research that is carried out, the more we will know about the causes um, and how we can better manage these um, going into our sub-regional planning framework. Uh, the recent research indicates a link between nitrogen and phosphorus and cyanobacteria cover. And the more we find out about these concentrations um, and sources, the more we'll be able to feed these into the nutrient limit setting process. Uh, just to mention how the microbiology fits into the coastal plan. We actually have in the coastal plan they classify the water into three different categories aquatic ecosystems, contact recreation, and shellfish gathering. 
So we use this, uh, the data from our program to assess if we're, we're meeting the standards in the coastal plan in the area. So for example, in, in this uh, picture of Littleton Harbour, Whakarapa, you'll see a lot of that upper harbour is designated for contact recreation. So we look at the results in the upper harbour to see if that's um, actually happening. And uh, in Littleton Harbour, it is. So uh, meeting the targets for contact recreation, we consider very good, good and fair, fair which means they're generally suitable most of the time as meeting uh, contact recreation standards. community members sampling sites in Akaroa Harbour, uh, Whakarapo and the Open Heathcote Estuary. Uh, a lot of that work was uh, organised by the Resource Care Group, which uh, with restructuring that group went, so there was no one to coordinate that programme and uh, we also felt that we were quite restricted in the fact that, for example, in Akaroa Harbour, all of the sampling would have to be done by about seven in the morning so that they could then meet the courier to get the samples over to the lab. And so we couldn't do any strategic sampling, for example, around tides. Uh, and it did get to be quite an issue, getting the samples uh, also done consistently. So some people would decide that they would rather go somewhere where they thought it was really bad or just outside their front door to make it easier for them. So we really needed to tighten up the programme, particularly when it's now going to national reporting and there's a lot more pressure to on the, the use of that data. So, but it really it started with the fact that we didn't have the resource care people to do all that background work, working with the communities and, and that took a lot of time. It's a really good Thing. It's a good point because I mean, what it did do was engage people. So it's a, and often there is a real trade-off with community monitoring and engagement, getting people involved, which is great, but also to do with kind of quality of data, logistics and things. And it worked really well for, for quite a while and then we just had to make a call and say, actually, we'll take on another student to cover that. Uh, that's probably to do with like those served diatoms. We had that um, very brown stained water. Uh, the, the diatoms break down and because they've got enzymes, just like you get in your washing powder, when that gets stirred up by the wind and the waves, you get that foam formed. 
So that's what is accumulating on the beach. So when we're out there, we do take account of things like phone lines on the beach and colours of the phone. How do you decide where to take your samples? A lot of the sites have probably been around for 31 years since King started. Uh, a lot of the sites have been decided by community members, so when they were sampling uh, in those particular areas, like Upper Isle Harbour, there's probably sites that the community decided would be good sites to sample. Uh, some councils are now doing evaluations of use to decide where they're going to sample. <laughs> Uh, so that if you've got limited resources or funding, they might, they'll only be sampling the most popular sites. But in reality, we do sample a lot of sites that I don't think of a high usage, but there is a lot of community interest in sites. And uh, I think I'm right in saying, Leslie, isn't it, that at the start of each year, it is reviewed with the different agencies, and if you know if there's local knowledge on a site that has become more popular, it gets put in if we can afford it and things like that, is it? That's right. It is, and for example in the estuary with the earthquakes, one site, which was the Mount Pleasant Yacht Club, um, you couldn't get to that site so we've now changed, oh no, the Pleasant Point Yacht Club, you couldn't get to that site so we've moved the site to the opposite side of the estuary. So, you know, we make small changes, but we like to keep consistency in the sites because if you get a new site, you need five years of data before you can grade it. So, yeah, it's good to have that consistency. And, and the main criteria is that it's used, you know, people swim there or they use it for contact recreation. Um, Leslie, with the, with the likes of the Uh, in terms of that report and that data that I showed you on that hum about the human sources, um, the report was paid for by City Council and Environment Canterbury, so uh, they are aware of that issue. They're very aware of problems. And the councils get notified yeah. as part of the process at the back. this summer really early, um, driven by the low flows, but I think it's more we're, we're finding it a lot more, we're going looking for it a lot more, and we're also picking up new sites, so whereas we might not necessarily have known it used to be there, so it's quite difficult to judge, but it's, it's certainly not great this summer. One more question. So if I was to take home a message about are things getting better or worse, what message should I be taking home? Is, is that for cytobacteria or...? Um, so yeah. what, what messages, what should I be taking, is it getting better or worse? Um, hey, I'm just thinking back to the targets report. <laughs> I think in the targets report it's still in terms of micro, it's still fairly similar in rivers. I think lakes may be improving. Um, cyanobacteria, <coughs> as I said, it's, it's too hard to tell because we had such a lack of information before we knew it was such an issue. Um, I don't know, Adrian, if you've got <laughs> any thoughts? It's, it's certainly a question that everyone, that everyone is posing because it's much more in your face now and things like that. But I agree with Kimberly, it's a, it's a hard one to definitively answer because it's a growing and emerging issue that we're more aware of rather than it's necessarily you know, getting worse and extrapolating. I can see wit imitating people squirming out of it. I guess one thing I would say is that, and I sent it around in the email today, that there was a target set for 2015, which was, was it 80%? 80 and we didn't meet that target. And in fact, there has been some deterioration in the freshwater sites 
over the last, uh, I know over the last four to five years, the numbers in the lower categories has gone up, and that's, so there's been some dropping. So things have not been improving, and it's certainly something that we're well aware of. You know, it's, it's, it's part of what we're working on in the CWMS is to try and improve that. The, the other thing is with climate cycles of such a short period, is are we seeing it worse at the moment because we're going through a particular dry period, and is that a representative trend or not? I'm and supposed it, to be. Yeah, and another thing that I'll just raise that I, I get asked a lot, I have to say, as own committees, is this thing about a five-year average, because it is, a fi it is done over five years, and therefore, if things are improving, it will not respond quickly, because it is done over five years. And um, so you know, people say, well, why can't we do it on an annual average? Well, one of the answers to that is, you know, think of it the other way as well. It's deliberately conservative just to try and give us a general indication. But it's a really good example of where the monitoring program and the monitoring protocols and the measures were designed for a slightly different purpose. And sometimes when you bring it into another target area, it just you know, makes it doesn't quite fit quite so well. We just have to be a bit more aware of that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish um, now. And uh, just before we thank Leslie and Kimberly again for a really great talk, I just point out this is the last science seminar for the um, for the year and we'll be starting again in early February we've got one lined up we haven't quite got the date absolutely done yet but um, Phil Grove will be talking about wetlands and um, so that that will be in early February keep an eye out for when that is but um, really I just want to say thank you to Leslie and Kimberly for a um, another great science seminar